fans of the PBS documentary slash reality show, The Office and American Workplace, have become increasingly more intrigued with a local news story during the time the documentary was being filmed. Yes, the series which aired in 2012 on PBS and quickly syndicated across the country and even gained more traction on streaming platforms, shed light to what most of us in the Lackawanna County area live through, the terror, trial, and aftermath of the Scranton Strangler. You know, the identity of the Strangler has gotten so popular over the last several years, well we, the ones who lived through it, uh, we thought it was done. Look, we caught the guy. We felt safe for a while. You know, after they caught that guy, Scub. But you see, a lot of us started questioning things that we started to see in the background of this documentary. I know I did. You know, it was so hard to relive the trauma. Seeing it brought up in that documentary over and over again. Look, I love my city. Have we had some weirdos in the past? Sure. There was that serial flasher that made that documentary thing. There was traffic stops and domestic disputes. Same kind of things that happen in every city. Well, the first time I heard about the Scranton Strangler would have been in early 2010. I told my friend I was going to head to the gym and she was like, hey, be safe. And I gave her a weird look and she was like, uh, all those stranglings going on? Well, uh, I was running my construction company back then. Uh, lots of late hours, uh, lots of nights stuck in the office, um, sending invoices, uh, running bids, uh, you know, you know, all the stuff that that comes with being an entrepreneur uh, that they don't put on a poster. You know, so I'm, I'm walking uh, to my truck. It's half past 10. Uh, and I'm telling you, I saw this woman uh, walking down the street and she turns to the alley. Um, you know, and I'm thinking, well, if this is Manhattan or Philly, that would be kind of weird. Uh, but it's Scranton, you know? Uh, what's the worst that can happen? Well, the way I remember it, we got a call back in late January of 2010. Well, I was walking down an alley uh, to get to where I parked my car. I saw a man uh, wearing a trench coat. My first thought was that he must have been waiting for someone or cosplaying or something but I guess he was waiting for me. So we got this call from dispatch saying to get down to Lackawanna and Mifflin. There had been a strangling. I tried to get in my car, and as I got closer, I heard footsteps behind me. I started to panic and reach for my keys, but I fumbled them and dropped them, and I'm always doing that, I'm so clumsy. I reached down to pick them up, but I heard the footsteps right behind me. I looked in the reflection of my car windows and that guy was right there. I shrieked, but he grabbed my neck and began to squeeze. So I hear this shriek uh, and I spring into action. And you know, I'm thinking, well, somebody's trying to get their jollies off. Uh, not in my city. Uh, so I grabbed my tire iron uh, and I run down the alley, and uh, I turn to find this girl uh, just laying there, looking lifeless. You know what was always so strange about this whole strangler madness? Was that that was the only thing the sicko ever did. Every victim told the same story. He approached them in the dark, well he you know, and then he let them go right before the point of no return. That's some sadistic stuff right there. It all happened so fast. I was in shock, and I couldn't begin to explain what happened. Things went dark, and when I woke up, there was a man standing over me, asking me if I were okay. He had the police on the line, and they were there so fast. Well, at first, uh, I thought I'd just scare the dude away, you know? Um, 
but it seems uh, that was just his game the whole time. I mean, sure, we treat some collapsed windpipes and whatnot, but what kind of psychological damage does knowing that that person is still out there and maybe next time he'll just finish the job? There were curfews from then on. Like, we watched each other's backs. We even formed neighborhood watch groups, just trying to really protect each other. The police were so desperate. You know, when they asked me to face Scub in court, it was one of the hardest things I ever had to do. So we know the story, right? Blah, 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 strangling, yada, yada, then boom, a huge break in the case. We got convictions and we got trials and we got, we got lawyers and we got everything all settled. And then, and then, and then after the sentencing, it's just, it's just over. Look, like I said, we got the guy. There's a big car chase and everything. Successfully apprehended, tried, and sentenced. Now he's serving his life in a county lockup. That is, until people like you started poking your noses into things because of a stupid documentary. If you just leave the police work up to, I don't know, the police, I think the world would be much safer. It's hard to convey my feelings. Like, I mustered everything up to make sure that Scub paid for what he did to me and all his other victims. Just to find out that maybe he was innocent. Right, we're, we're all celebrating in the streets. Um, you know, fast forward a few years, and my buddy asked me um, if I seen this documentary on PBS. And I said, what am I, this 78-year-old grandma? Who's got time for PBS documentaries? I know it's called a documentary, but it always seems so surreal, sort of fake. Like, you know, when you're watching The Real Housewives and you get caught up in all this drama, even though it seems pretty scripted, that it's not real. So I turned it on the next night, and, uh, you know, as I'm watching it, uh, I see Meredith on the show, and I went to high school with her kid. And I'm thinking, uh, I know that woman. That's Miss Palmer. It was kind of crazy seeing local places and local faces. These people kind of became like local stars. But then PBS sold the rights and the documentary all over the nation, making Scranton kind of well known all across the country. Scranton. It was really cool for a bit, you know, like when I'd go traveling, people ask where you're from, and I'm like, oh, I'm from Scranton. And they'd be like, really? Do you know that documentary, like Michael Scott or Kevin? And the only person I really knew was Meredith, but not for reasons I want to talk about. I mean, sure, this, this reality show had some over-the-top moments. I mean, what reality show doesn't? I mean, that's what reality shows do. They embellish to keep you watching, keep you, keep you engaged, to keep, to, 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 to get your, the prongs right in your mind so you just have to watch that opium and get that fix over and over again that's what reality shows do and it, but it wasn't until netflix started airing this reality show oh and I, that i started watching it and starting no, or noticing the ordinances and the nuances over and over again there's something about these people's lives you just you just get wrapped up in it you know you know, well, the doc was great for business. Um, everyone uh, in the area was coming down to check out Scranton. Uh, you know, I had so many projects going on at the time that I had to turn down work. Uh, it was going good. Did I know any of the office folks? Well, I never watched any of that garbage, but yeah. Well, as the new guy, I had to work with a lot of the volunteer sheriffs. Well, Stroop was one of them for the longest time. Such an odd guy. But he really cared about the community, so figured he was harmless enough. 
sometimes there would be a lot of commotion going on like at the grocery store or at the mall you know because somebody from the office was there there was a lot at the local pub poor richards you know i would try to sneak in and get on camera but you also don't know what they were doing was it like making of a murder yeah i kind of love the documentary it was cool to see some local people talk about local things there was always so much happening, but the stakes were always so low. It was kind of comforting in a sense. That all changed when they finally got to what they filmed in 2010. This frame set me back 55 bones, but she decided to take her sweet time, so now I have to switch it with today's paper. This move, he can't get you. Well, I think that he could counter that move. This Grand Strangler is a professional strangler. Oh, please. I wish he'd come after me. I would be like, Twice, sir! Too late. If I was the real Scranton Strangler, you'd be so strangled by now. 911, hello. Scranton Strangler's in the house. Inside the house. Grandpa, where were you the day the Scranton Strangler was caught? Well, I was there, kiddo. Well, let's just say I'll be up to my neck in jury duty. <laughs> That was the worst joke ever. It was a little surreal, seeing stuff about the stranglings in the show. It really triggered some trauma. But at the same time, there's something oddly settling about seeing these snapshots in time. Like, I live through an attack, and none of these people get anywhere close but you can see it impacted them in several ways for several years. To know how everything ended up with justice being served, it's kind of a cathartic experience. Yeah, that dock crew came sniffing around a time or two, mostly due to that shrewd fella, but we didn't give them the time of day. I don't think our tax dollars should be going towards cops becoming reality stars. So I just had to stonewall them for the most part. When they started asking questions about the Strangler case, that was even more bizarre. I remember asking them what their interest in this case was. Weren't they just filming an office? But we had to do that kind of stuff all the time. People were getting weird even before we apprehended Scub. I mean, there were vigilantes out there looking for the Strangler, neighborhood watches, all sorts of stuff out there. But you see, a lot of us started questioning things that we started to see in the background of this documentary. I know I did. I started looking at these things and it started making me ask questions like... Timelines. I mean, the timelines don't add up. People had gotten kind of weird about this whole thing in the last five years. Asking questions, analyzing that stupid documentary. It was scub. It was Scub. Look, we caught the guy red-handed. Okay, I mean, not like that, but you know it's him. There was a mountain of evidence against him. Even strangled dudes in prison. People say that it wasn't Scub. There's so many conspiracy theories out there. Like, I do think it's creepy to think that the Strangler could still be out there. Look, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's not Scub, but when you listen to these people, uh, they, they got some pretty good points. Who do I think the Strangler is? It's, it's not Scub. I mean, it's clear from the very beginning, Scub, they're trying to set him up as the bad guy. I mean, look at, look, look how they refer to Scub. They refer to him as George Howard Scub. Three names. Three names are associated with bad guys all the time. Let me, let me, let me prove my point. John Wayne Gacy, three names. Another one, Lee Harvey Oswald. All three names. George Howard Scub, all over, all again and again and again. They're just reinforcing the bad guy narrative from day one.
All right, Jim, your quarterlies look very good. How are things going at the library? I was recently a juror on the Scranton Strangler. A man's being put to death. I was part of the verdict. And I'm not so sure he's guilty anymore. Oh, yeah. With recent doubts being cast about the guilty verdict against George Howard Scubb, the Scranton Strangler, many citing mistrial concerns exposed in the American Workplace documentary, several grassroots efforts that began on social media sites like Reddit and Twitter, funded by crowdsourced sites like GoFundMe, now appear to have some legs with Scubb's lawyers claiming a mistrial. Some major news with the Scranton Strangler trial today. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has agreed to hear the case, making an exception that lower courts wouldn't allow. Today marks the first day of freedom for George Scubb, the vindicated man accused of committing a string of stranglings from 2010 to 2012. He's being released after the courts upheld the mistrial appeal. While experts say this doesn't clear Scubb's name 100% as the investigation to the Scranton Strangler is now reopened. Good to go. Test, test, test. I don't know, I don't see a light or anything. There's no light, it's fine. It, it should be working fine. Let's go ahead and get started. Just for my records, can you state your name? Uh, sure, it's uh, George Howard Scubb. Really, I mean, if you really get down to it, everybody's a suspect. Jim? Nice guy. Oh, he wouldn't do anything wrong. Really? Grandpa, where were you the day the Scranton Strangler was caught? Well, I was there, kiddo. I was there. This is my website that I started to get the ball rolling. Can you imagine the indignities that this man had to go through? so that the, the media could all uh, uh, call make him look like a patsy, just take his freedom away. Just like that, his future is gone. George Howard Scubb is a devil man. I'm not gonna lie, I don't feel good about them letting that man out of prison. I get that the documentary had enough evidence of a mistrial and somehow Scubb got enough money together to get this appeal going, but it's just creepy. Like, if it wasn't Scubb, who was it? Or worse, what if it was actually him and now he's just out there somewhere? So, should be good to go. Test, test, test. You know, I'm always watching my back. You know, it, it probably was Scub. Um, you know, if it wasn't Scub, um, then why did all these stranglings stop as soon as he got put away? I know. I've been watching the news. People keep texting me, ask me if I'm all right. I, I get it. I want to trust the system, but trusting the system right now means that the man who attacked me is just out there right now. And I was so sure it was Scub. Like it was sealed in concrete in my mind. Trying to undo that hasn't been easy. Let's go ahead and get started. Just for my records, can you state your name? Uh, sure, it's uh, George Howard Scub. I'm here to uphold the law, and the law is the law. But that scumbag doesn't belong on the streets. One slip up, one thought of putting his hands on somebody in this city. I'm putting him away for good. Okay, so go ahead and tell us about your childhood. I mean, what are you gonna say? I tortured turtles and killed cats? No, it was, it was a normal Pennsylvania upbringing. I mean, we vacationed in the Finger Lakes. We took the trip to Disneyland. We did the whole high school field trip to Manhattan. Uh, I played drums in the, in the high school band, and to be honest, at the time, I was a bit of a nerd. Did you go to college? 
Uh, no, I wasn't that big on the idea of college, uh, so I went to sales right out of school. Um, I was actually able to get in a local company and, and made a decent living for myself and my wife. You were married. I actually wasn't aware of that. What happened? I'd, uh, I'd actually rather not talk about that, if that's all right. Oh, yeah. I went to middle school and a little bit of high school with Scub's wife. She was so sweet. I mean, we lost track of each other after high school. And in, like, 2009, I found out that she died of pharyngeal cancer from Facebook, of all places. I mean, the whole situation is just so sad. But it wasn't until years later that I connected she was Scub's wife. Let's just switch gears a little bit. I'm, I'm going to ask you something very bluntly, just to frame the rest of this interview. Are you the Scranton Strangler? No. Of course he's going to plead his innocence. You're giving him a platform to propagate his lies on. They caught the Scranton Strangler. They trapped him in his house. Okay, so walk us through the series of events here. When did you first hear about the Strangling? Uh, I mean, I think like most people, I mean, Scranton isn't that big. You hear about, hey, this girl's strangled by Alfredo's, or oh, hey, this guy was choked behind the bowling alley. You know, it, it didn't mean that much to me until the cops came kicking in my door telling me that I was ID'd at the scene. Right, that was the uh, O'Kearney case, right, back in September? Yeah, yeah, it was uh, about a year, year or so after my wife passed. Uh, my company found out that I was being investigated for the stranglings, and uh, they just dropped me like a bag of potatoes. That is believed to be inside. Police have now surrounded... So the police report, November 11th, 2010, says that you refused to answer any more questions for the police. Then you barricaded yourself in your one-bedroom ranch and refused to open up the door, threatening to shoot anyone who attempted to enter. You exited unexpectedly, somehow managing to get to your blue-green sedan, leading the police on a high-speed chase through the city. And all of that ended with you pulling over and giving yourself up. Can you walk us through what you were thinking that day? Yeah, put yourself in my shoes. It's really not that complicated. I, I felt backed into a corner. I lost everything that I had. The police were making me out to be some sort of monster that I wasn't, so I did what many people would do and I snapped. I made some bad choices, but I mean, ultimately, I pulled over and gave myself up and that's what should matter. So we're responding to a 1097 nonviolent call for backup as some investigators went to interview Scub for like the fifth time. I guess they wanted to catch him in some sort of story screw up. I don't know. I wasn't working that case directly. This is surrounded. And we now see what appears to be a SWAT van a SWAT, pulling SWAT's up. arriving. By the time we got in there, it had already turned into a total chat show. Scub locked himself inside, refusing to answer the questions. These investigators wouldn't let it go and say he shot a gun. Of course, Scud says none of that is true, but he's a lowlife. So what do I care what he has to say? Anyways, we got his place surrounded and he somehow still makes the slip and just takes off. But he's wishing he had a hybrid, right? 60 miles to the gallon in the city. No, I bet he's wishing he was strangling someone. Okay, that's our street. So where were you going? That's actually kind of complicated. Um, I don't think that some of it I can legally say just yet, uh, but the short of it was that I'd literally become obsessed to figure out who the Scranton Strangler was, and I knew the cops had their eyes on me, but you know, obviously I, I'm not the guy. So when I got to the car, I tried to lead the police to really the only lead that I had, which was in the vicinity of that stupid office park. That's our street. He's going down our street. Come on, okay, everybody. Go, 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 go. Can you believe all the weird coincidences with that documentary? And anyway, by the, by the time I was flying down the road, I, I realized this whole thing was so stupid and it made me look guilty and then I don't even think that those jurors ever really even gave me a chance. Right. As you know, your mistrial was mainly predicated on the American Workplace documentary, which aired on PBS back in 2013. One of your jurors was actually on that reality show. Have you watched the documentary? Yeah, so... Uh, 
So PBS is, is actually one of the few channels that we got back in, in prison. And uh, a bunch of us were in the rec room one night and uh, look over and the documentary comes on the TV. Yeah, I didn't think much of it until the diversity training episode when the, uh, the juror shows up out of the blue and I can literally feel my blood start to boil. I mean, I was filled with a little bit of rage as you can imagine. That's interesting. So Toby Flinderson, the HR rep from Dunder Mifflin, his verdict actually led to your conviction, but then his statements on the documentary not only inspired the masses to come to your aid, but they ultimately led to enough evidence to overturn the sentencing. Oh, I know. And that is even more complicated. So who do I think the real Scranton Strangler is? I've done a lot of work here. <laughs> I've done all the work here. And I, I, I've seen the timelines and I've seen the interviews and I've seen, I've seen the police reports. I've seen all of these things. And I know that they are all intertwined to the American workplace documentary. Think about all the weird connections. You have Jim and Pam and baby being born at the same time a full article, a full article, is taken out in the Scranton newspaper about the Stranglings. This frame set me back 55 bones, but she decided to take her sweet time, so now I have to switch it with today's paper. All the time he's mentioned. Scranton Strangler. The Scranton Strangler. The Scranton Strangler. The Scranton Strangler. Scranton Strangler. Scranton Strangler. The Scranton Strangler. Scranton Strangler! Thank you. Thank you, Scranton Strangler. Scranton Strangler. The Scranton Strangler. The Scranton Strangler. Sure. Scranton Strangler. All the time he's mentioned, it's just the fact that this, that Scub's car was in the parking lot at Dunder Mifflin. The fact that Toby Flinderson becomes a juror and then becomes obsessed about the stranglings after that, it says something about a false sentencing, right? I mean, the documentary happened and this insane amount of evidence just pops up. The biggest question of this documentary, and I'm not the only one out there that believes this, what if one of the subjects of the American Workplace documentary on PBS is the Strangler, just hiding in plain sight? These wackadoos and their half-baked ideas, we got the guy. And he got off on a technicality, but the investigation is still open. Who do you think the Strangler was? I mean, I've heard the theories. Oh, <laughs> man, there are tons of people in this documentary who could be the Strangler. Dwight Schrute. Dwight Schrute. Thank you, Mr. Schnute. Physically imposing, he's over six feet tall, and he's consistently out of touch with reality. Sort of control things with my mind. I don't believe you. Continue. And exhibits some of the most strange control of anger I've ever seen. His connections with the Scranton PD are subject at best, and the perfect alibi to pin the stranglings on someone else. To my chickens, I'm the Scranton Strangler. Then there's Gabe, who suspiciously shows up around the first times of the stranglings. <laughs> he definitely has violent tendencies. Shut up about the sun! Walk away, bitch. And he's not easily ruled out as a suspect. You don't want to get on my bad side. I've seen some horrible things. I own over 200 horror movies. Okay. And then there's Michael Scott. Jeez, man. That... Everybody thinks that guy is just this doe-eyed village idiot, but there's something there, guys. There's something there. I, you know what? I have a bunch of letters cut out of magazines in my desk. You can use those. He's got something underneath the surface, and he's just... He's scary. He's scary. And I think he even talks about having a loaded gun in the desk, right? Damn, I have a loaded gun in my desk at work. I'm not saying it's to him. I'm just saying it could be not him, too. There's something more sinister. Sinister at play. Really, I mean, 
if you really get down to it, everybody's a suspect. Jim, nice guy. Oh, he wouldn't do anything wrong. Really? Hey, Jim. Not now, Toby, my oh, God. Jesus. Get the hell out of here, idiot. What did I do? Do you see what he did with just, what he was just a little stressed out by Dwight? Crazy, what? I can't reconnect with you right now. Hold on one second. Oh! oh. I mean, he could have done some permanent damage right there, right? And he didn't even blink an eye. And he treats Dwight for he treats Dwight for years with sociopathic behavior, right? I mean, <laughs> someone replaced all my pens and pencils with crayons. I suspect Jim Halbert. I ought to be able to cut my. Way. Everyone has called me Dwayne all day. I think Jim Halpert paid them to. What is going on? What are you doing? Jim Halpert said there was an abandoned infant in the woman's room. When I went to save the child, I saw Meredith on the can. So from time to time, I send Dwight faxes from himself, from the future. Every time I typed my name, it said diapers. Louder, I son! Buttmaker! Our prices have He's never been lower! Stop it. Heat! That is totally inappropriate. This morning, I knocked myself in the head with the phone. That actually took a while. I had to put uh, more and more nickels into his handset until he got used to the weight. And then I just took them all out. Where is my desk? Oh, dude, uh, how did... Knock it off, okay? I'm interviewing you. No, you said that I'd be conducting the interview when I walked in here. Now, exactly how much pot did you smoke? This morning, I found a bloody glove in my desk drawer, and Jim Halpert tried to convince me I committed murder. I think he may be the real murderer. I think he may be the real murderer. Creed Brenton? Holy crap. I mean, that guy... That guy's definitely insane. I'm 30. Well, in November, I'll be 30. Holy crap. I mean, the dude is literally hiding from the law in plain sight. Who does that? During that time, the police say he sold drugs and trafficked in endangered species meat and stole weapons-grade LSD from the military. The dude is definitely a suspect, right? <laughs> I live by the quarry. We should hang out by the quarry and throw things down there. Todd Packer, Kevin Malone, Oscar Martinez, Andrew Bernard, David freaking Wallace. They're all hiding something. They're all all capable of terrible things. And any one of them could be the strangler. Well, no. None of the Dunder Mifflin employees were suspects at that time. What about now? I can't say. There's an active, ongoing investigation. Oh, everyone has their theories. I mean, it's all over the place. I've watched The American Workplace about 20 times now, and I keep catching little things. After hearing all those theories on Reddit and stuff, I definitely think it was Toby. Um, probably Toby. But Toby Wyatt Flinderson. Yeah, two, two people can play the three-name game. You see what I did there? Toby Wyatt Flinderson. Welcome. I'm Tony. He's suspect number one. He's the Kaiser so safe of subjects. Literally from day one of the documentary, he fits every bill. Every check mark on the sociopathic checklist, he checks. He's by and large extremely terrifying. Well, Toby. The fact that the cops never looked at him as a subject is alarming at worst and criminal at best. Think about what was going on in his life at the time of the show. I mean, he had clearly had a thing for Pam. So did you hear? What? Pam's back on the market again. Really? She's standing? Hey, Pam. Hey, what's up? I just completely forgot what I was going to say. It's so weird. Okay. But Jim was more aggressive than him. Pam. Sorry. Um, 
Are you free for dinner tonight? Yes. All right. Then it's a date. And Jim and Pam were only months away from getting married when the strangling started. Coincidence? I think Toby was jealous of Jim, but, but not because of Pam. Toby was jealous over Jim's assertiveness. And I think Toby wanted to start asserting himself by choking people. So I know I have one burning question that I think everybody has. If you are innocent, what happened that day with Mr. Flinderson when he came to visit you in prison? Toby, you cannot keep blathering on about this Scranton strangler. Do something about it. Get it out of your system, whatever it takes. I'm going to the prison this afternoon. Come and talk to the strangler. Uh, Toby Flinderson, I'm here to see George Howard Scubb. This is the prison. Um, I will meet George Howard Scubb. I will tell him that I believe he is innocent. Well, the good news is no more guilty conscience. At least you know he is the strangler. The proof is in the grip. I think we're all set up. Can you give me your name and your profession? Yeah, of course. My name is John Weiler, and I'm a criminal profiler for the FBI. Okay, so what is your process and your output? Well, it's not much different from a standard psychologist. We put together the pieces of an individual based on evidence collected, first-hand accounts, and what we know from the digital paper trails to profile a suspect. The goal of this is to sometimes help law enforcement know a little more about the individual committing crimes, and sometimes it's used to help identify patterns in the suspect's activity. Okay, so you are familiar with the Scranton Strangler case, so give us some thoughts. Well, like most things, some things are easy to identify on the surface, and some are not. The fact that the Strangler didn't commit murder, not even once, tells me that the crimes were a lot more about the psychological state of the individual rather than targeted attacks against the victim. Based on forensics and victim reports, the uh, police concluded that the suspect here, the Strangler, was a man ranging from about 5'10 to 6'3. Most of the victims of the Stranglings were women or smaller than average men. This would lead us to believe that the Strangler is desperate for some sense of control in their life, as they avoided any and all physical altercations, opting to surprise attack each victim. The Strangler covered his face, wore a long coat and a hat, which definitely indicates that they weren't ready for anyone to really know who they were. This could indicate that the individual is emotionally masked and hidden as well. With the Strangler's ability to assert their dominance physically, one could assume he has some sort of martial arts training. The Strangler's ability to know when to let off to ensure the victim didn't fully suffocate probably means that the perp is educated, maybe even understands the respiratory system or is CPR trained. There was some evidence that the victims were resuscitated after their stranglings. The mere act of strangling someone face to face is an intimate act, meaning that this person might feel alone in life and is attempting along with the sense of control to emulate intimacy. It's also very possible that these stranglings were intertwined with the victim's sexual appetite. The act of strangling was an aphrodisiac, and if not the criminal act itself, maybe just the heightened sense of importance or the sense of satisfaction gained from knowing that they were hiding so well. So you've read the psych profile on Scub. Do you think that he fits the bill for the Scranton Strangler? Well, this wasn't my case, and it's definitely not my job. Well, just speculation. Yes, Scub fit some of the marks here. His height, his lack of alibis, his loneliness, his dead-end job, his need for intimacy, and his brashness were all marks. It's just... It's just what? Everything we know about the Strangler would suggest that he was non-confrontational. My psyche valve concluded that this individual would not put up a fight if he were confronted with the truth. And Scub, on the other hand, definitely put up a fight. So what are you saying? I don't think it's definitely Scub. What happened that day with Mr. Flinderson when he came to visit you in prison? This guy comes in the room, he sits down right across from me, he looks me dead in the face, and this guy tells me, he says, that he was the strangler. It's never the person you most suspect. 
it's also never the person you least suspect. Okay, I've spent some time on this, and I've talked to local law enforcement. I've spent time on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I've done the work. I mean, these are real people out there doing real things, and any one of them can be a deranged psychopath. People say the strangling stopped after the strangles went to prison. But here's my question, here's, here's mine. Did they? They did. They stopped. You know when? When we captured George Howard Scum. They caught the Scranton Strangler. They trapped him in his house. There hasn't been a single crime matching the Strangler's M.O. since we apprehended him. Of course they would say that. It fits their narrative. It's like you have to read between the lines, man, all right? What I'm saying is what if the Strangler changed his M.O. to something far more sinister? If he could get away with stranglings undetected, and even more, he could find someone who could be put away for his crimes, he can get up to all the darker stuff now. The theory kind of tracks. We find that once a perp becomes bored of a particular thrilling action, or their sense of satisfaction, or in this case, control is lacking, then they'll inevitably escalate the behavior. If the strangler is still out there, it's entirely possible that they've found a way to operate without law enforcement finding the commonalities. So Scub's out, and the psych profile by and large doesn't fit. But more than that, he has alibis. And the physical evidence at the scene of a crime could have been planted. We didn't plant evidence. Yeah. And next you're going to tell me satellites are real. With all the weirdities between The Strangler and the American Workplace documentary on PBS, how could they not be interconnected, The Strangler and the documentary, working together? Do you know where most of Americans heard about The Scranton Strangler? From the American Workplace documentary, episode after episode. It was like history getting rewritten. Like, none of us heard of this thing called a Scranton Strangler until that documentary showed up. And then, that should have been making national news, right? Yeah, I heard about it on the news. Yeah, it was all over the news. Yeah, I saw it while I was vacationing in Cabo. I'm pretty sure Strangle Scranton was a trending hashtag on Twitter. So, I decided to do what any good investigative reporter would do. I started to dig for evidence, and thankfully, most of the evidence was in the syndicated workplace documentary that I saw on PBS and was streaming now all across the world. So, let's get into it. I have files, files of documents and of evidence that have been obscured by me and my colleagues at the FBI. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the feds are super interested in this. So let's see what we have here. Ah, the first person, Gabriel Susan Lewis. So when Dunder Mifflin was bought out by Sabre in 2010, Gabe had the pleasure of being the coordinating director of Emerging Regions. Interesting, his presence in Scranton literally coincides with the first stranglings. That's not a coincidence. What's interesting is after Scubb's trial, Lewis's behavior becomes erratic and bizarre, and he really exhibits stalker behavior. Maybe he decided to stop the spree after Scubb was apprehended, knowing that he got off scot-free, but he couldn't stick to the straight and narrows. And the urges just slowly began to surface through his behavior, right? Gabe does fit a lot of the profile. He's lonely, he's physically fit, and he's consistently not taken seriously by his superiors and his coworkers. F*** you, Gabe. I mean, we got some calls about this guy back in 2011. 
I had to look him up. There were some complaints about student films or something he was making. No one ever really wanted to press charges, so nothing ever really came of all that. Who really knows it's a Gabe, but he's not off my list. Who's next? Um, oh, Creed Branton. That dude's a liar, a psycho, and a criminal. We can all agree on that. He's violent. He showed, oh, oh, remember that time that he showed up all bloody? Yeah. There has been a murder, and you are a suspect. Okay, hang on just a sec. Let me settle in, and I'll be right back. Very good. Yeah, Creed Bratton. He's an anomaly in these suspects. He doesn't really fit the profile that we've built on the Strangler, but you can tell me he confessed to the crimes today, and I don't think I'd be shocked. So this guy made us look like fools on the national stage. Here's Creed Bratton from the grassroots, sitting in my town, hiding from the law, literally down the street this entire time. He spent a year in lockup, and since his name's been cleared, he's been trying to revive his music career. Honestly, it's not that bad. I saw a friend today, it had been a while. Yeah, I mean, think about this. There are hidden messages in his songs. I mean, the guy's been quiet. He's been super quiet since he's gotten out of jail. Listen to this. What? Scranton Strangler. <laughs> oh, they got the wrong guy. <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> Who's next? Oh, 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 right here, right here. Kevin Malone. That guy doesn't seem to have a full grasp on reality. Like, the difference between life and death? Yeah, okay. There's so much more going on there, guys. Andrew Bernard, he's an interesting one, and here's why. Just because some preppy guy went to Cornell, we can trust him, right? Nope. One of the elites who think they can get away with anything because their daddy will pay for it all, right? He could totally be the strangler. His money could have easily been a way to pay off whoever it needed to to hide the fact that he's a rage monster. And your stupid face! And your stupid office! Ah! He's always looking for the slightest bit to control. He's a controlling, manipulative guy. Oh, and what was going on while the stranglings were just taking hold? He was going through a sexual identity crisis. Getting emasculated and having his love spurned. The daddy couldn't pay off, could you, Andrew Bernard? Look through all of these. They're all out there. They're all on the documentary. They're all on the web, guys. Michael Scott is clearly a sociopath. Todd ba Packer literally poisoned the whole office with tainted cupcakes. Even David Wallace went through a really weird phase in 2010. Obviously, all of these people can't be the strangler. Unless. Unless, what if they were all the strangler? creating alibis for each other, plotting their crimes, planning their victims, running their nose in some sick crime spree. And they're literally playing ring around the rosies around Scranton's neck. I mean, okay, but it's worth investigating. That's all I'm saying, but no, you had to choose one person who fit the profile, the timeline, the physical evidence, the eyewitness reports. But my own gut says it was Toby Wyatt Flinders. Oh, I, I think it's that Toby Flinderson guy. Toby Flinderson, without a doubt. It could be Toby Flinderson. Every time you ask me if it's one of these yahoos from Dunder Mifflin, I'm telling you, we got the guy. It's kind of hard to explain. <laughs> so I watched this documentary for years, forming relationships, one-sided, of course, with these people. You know, I know they're real people, but it's like, 
oh, I like this person and I hate that one. And when they started bringing up the stranglings, it was kind of triggering the trauma from years before, but I never really connected much. Like I never really thought about it until I heard something that I just couldn't shake off. He fits the profile, guys. He's the iconic tell of a mundane, quiet guy secretly snapping and begin a dastardly spree. Evil. You know, he seems like the kind of guy, uh, you know, when people are talking on the news uh, and, you know, their neighbor just killed somebody and, and you're like, well, how could he ever do that? Uh, it seems like he wasn't capable of that kind of thing. You know, people are sick, you know, even if you don't see it on the surface, you know, people are, people are sick. I've seen that guy around town. There's just something off about him, you know? So they've been talking about the Stranglings a couple of times during the sixth season of The Doc. And, well, maybe it's just my emotions were high, but I heard that man say something that chilled me to the bones. And it's not what he said, it's how he said it. If you are innocent, what happened that day with Mr. Flinderson when he came to visit you in prison? This guy comes in the room, he sits down right across from me, he looks me dead in the face, and this guy tells me, he says, that he was the strangler. Just like that? Just like that. I mean, I didn't know if he was joking, I didn't know if this was some sort of, you know, candid camera thing, I just, I, I stumbled over my words, but I think I said something like, uh, you know, like, why are you telling me this? And, and his response, and I'll never forget it, looks me dead in the eyes and says, because then nobody will ever believe you. I think like many other people, I filled up with rage, you know? I didn't know if he was messing with me. I didn't know if he was telling me the truth, but but when you back someone in the corner like that, when you, you knock them down and, and you take away other lifelines, and then you have the audacity to sit there with that smug look on your face. So, I mean, I lost it, I attacked him. Just strangled him? No, I didn't strangle him. That was a show he was putting on. It's like he went from hiding that he was the strangler, got me convicted, and decided that he'd get his rocks off by parading around now like he was all broken hearted for little old me. I mean, I don't understand the show that he was putting on, but it was really messed up. So you're saying you didn't strangle him? No, I lunged at him. I mean, I think I got one shot off to his ribs before about three COs started beating me down with their sticks and tasers. I mean, I remember looking up at the guy and he had this just like this empty look in his face like there was nothing there, but he looked so satisfied. Yeah, I heard what Scub said. Do you know how many emails I get a week since that stupid documentary on Netflix came out or wherever it's on now? It's the lunar landing was fake, lizard people, Illuminati. It's all make-believe. Some people even think that we covered stuff up. And can you believe that? Yep. Really, this individual meets most of the aspects of the profile we've built on the Strangler. That doesn't mean someone is guilty, but, well, in this case, professionally speaking, he's suspect number one. So you're saying that there's no chance that Toby Flinderson is a Scranton Strangler? Well, I ain't saying that. Look, we have an active investigation of which I can't expose the details of. There was that time when Toby was trying to get Michael to put radon tests around the office. And Michael's not listening to him. Then... These are silent killers. You are the silent killer. Go back to the annex. You'll see. I was in shock. I paused the TV. I rewound that. I listened to it again. You'll see. And again. You'll see. And again. I couldn't believe it. I was like, that's the guy. That's who strangled me. I went to the police that night, told them everything. I told them that I recognized the voice 
and they treated me like I was an idiot. Told me to buy a nice dinner on my way home and calm down. I see him now. I see him everywhere. Just one more question. I don't need the specifics. Can you tell me if Toby Flenderson is under investigation or not? Look, there's an active investigation. That's all I can say. And we didn't find anything on your computer. Good. Except this. Oh, wow. This is uh, just a mystery novel that I've been working on. The hardest thing about all of this is not knowing if I'm crazy. Like, what if I'm just listening to the crazy people on the internet? What if it really was Scub, who's also just out there now? But that voice. These are silent killers. You are the silent killer. Go back to the annex. You'll see. I wonder why Toby White Flinderson became a self-defense instructor. I mean, was it to scout out victims? Was it to find victims who couldn't fight back? I mean, what was he doing? It may have been my fault. What the hell, Toby? I'm aware of the vast theories that Mr. Flinderson might somehow be the strangler. That he evaded detection, carried out his deeds in secret. But you have to sit back and ask yourself, what goes on in the mind of someone who sits as a juror knowing that you're putting away an innocent man for crimes that you committed. How can you even function? Okay, okay, I might have gone down the whole rabbit hole here and trying to research this stuff myself too. I love the one year later thing that the doc did where we got to see everybody and where they're at. After Dwight fired me, I moved to New York to write the great American novel. I have six roommates. You know, this sounds a lot like the premise of my latest Chad Flenderman novel. I myself do own Toby's novels. I mean, I don't think they're that good. But after I started wondering about the whole Strangler thing, I started thinking, did Toby leave any clues inside his series? Chad Flenderman's kryptonite. Things that he wrote years down the road as a sick monster just reflected on his disgusting attacks. Ah, uh, yes. Write your own damn novel. Okay, I get it. We're in America. We're innocent until proven guilty. I get all of that. But to not look at Toby Wyatt Flinderson with some sort of skewed eyes is at the least ignorant. And at the worst, it's, it's a cover-up. Just one more question. I don't need the specifics. Can you tell me if Toby Flinderson is under investigation or not? Look, there's an active investigation. That's all I can say. I can't do anything about anything. That's what I'm saying, guys. That's what I'm saying. They don't want to look at Toby Wyatt Fenderson because they were so set on thinking this is the guy. Maybe something's going to pay off if they pinned it on Scub. Are you the Scranton Strangler? No. Here's what I know it's is Toby Wyatt Flinderson has the single largest evidence piled against him. That's including anyone, including George Scubb. I can tell you that. Well, let's break this down to see if there's anything to this. The Strangler didn't murder anyone. I would tend to conclude that this individual has lines that they don't like to cross, but doesn't mind getting really close to him. This oh, yeah, you ass Toby, you eat all that dog food yourself? Oh, oh, oh. While Flinderson isn't a physically imposing individual, his stature is definitely more dominating than the majority of the victims. Smile if you love men's prostates. Is there a reason to suspect that Toby might feel the need to lash out? Hey, Jim. Not now, Toby, my oh, God. Jesus. Get the hell out of here, idiot. Pretty nice rubs, I guess. Why? No, I, I wouldn't say I have a passion for HR. No! Ow! See ya. Well, of course there was. He does fit the height range the police concluded the strangler to be based on eyewitness counts and physical evidence. But the deeper stuff? Would I say this individual is struggling for some sense of control in his life? Does anyone have a camera here? 
Well, I'm not as personal psychologist, but from the limited perspective that I can see in the documentary, I don't think it's far-fetched to believe that Toby might feel desperate to exhibit some control over otherwise spiraling factors. That's how all the goofing around at Pam's desk and and hanging out with Pam was finally caught up to him. You know, with Pam. That, coupled with desperation fueled by loneliness, I think that the psych profile makes sense here. Flenderson didn't let on like an aggressive person, but from time to time exhibits aggression. He doesn't strike me as an unstable man, but from time to time, he's unstable. Further, once the trial is over, his obsession with the trial, taking any and all opportunities to invoke it in regular conversation or on public stage is bizarre at best. And the strange intertwining of the Strangler obsession coincides with his sexual aggressiveness when someone is willing to pay even the slightest amount of attention to him. Now that can certainly be innocuous, a man desperate for attention, leaping on the first potential partner who pays him any. And that's not even touching on his narcissistic tendencies. Hey, are you me? Yeah. Oh my god, what's up? I don't know if I believe it, but I am a fan of the hard-boiled detective novel. I'll punch you into mush, see? Even his novels, in which he's the titular hero character, performing investigations against heinous criminals, does either speak to his guilt or maybe his pride. That is to say, and this is speculation, that he's relishing in the fact he committed these crimes that no one could possibly ever solve, except himself. Toby. So let's look at some more evidence that we have right here. Toby from day one of the documentary clearly isn't happy. He's his job, he's mocked, he's mistreated, he's not taken very seriously, guys. Yep, it's all connected. These stranglings occur for a while and a whole city is just a buzz. Scuff says he was trying to lead the police to the real strangler. Like, that's going to help you, bud. They've already pinned it on you. They already knew in their minds who they were going to grab. Grandpa, where were you the day the Scranton Strangler was caught? Well, I was there, kiddo. I was there. Where was Toby on that day? Everyone sitting around Toby's desk watching the drama unfold at Toby's area and Toby gets a strange phone call. Isn't it obvious that the car is heading towards Dunder Mifflin and he gets a phone call? Who's calling you Toby? What's going on? Creed wasn't there too and that's also pretty suspicious. Then all of a sudden, Toby's standing as a juror in the Strangler's trial. I mean, how does that even happen? Unless the evidence is planted and it's a conspiracy against you from the beginning. But beyond that, how hard is it to convince all the other jurors, Toby Wyatt Flenderson, that the real Strangler is in there with them and the false Strangler is about to be accused of murder? How hard is it to do that when you're the juror? The dominoes was stacked up against Scub from the beginning. So he put Scub away, guy, like, bye-bye. And then after he put Scub away, he becomes obsessed with the trial. Does anyone else find this weird? Does anyone else find this strange? I know I do. The dude won't even enter a church. He gets strangled by the strangler in jail. And I think he went there like this smug little D-bag started chiding Scub, and Scub had to defend himself. And have you read those Chad Flinderman novels? Who gets obsessed with a case like this? Unless it's your own. Page 323, The Passions of an Average Housefly. A Chad Flinderman novel. Chad, now reflecting on all the crimes he solved, the ones he's caught, the ones that got away, was stricken with one single thought, as though all consciousness faded around him, sinking into the abyss of his mind, facing who he really was. What's he really done? 
The people he's lied to, the people he's hurt, the double life he's led. As though a vacuum ripped the air from the room, the air from Chad's lungs went out right with it. As he suffocated in his thoughts with remorse and sorrow, the clarity came over him as he struggled to breathe, as though this epiphany were brought by the absence of breath. The clarity he once sought high and low for was now ever present, and in that clarity came peace. Like, what in the does that even mean? It's all here. Double life, suffocated, struggled to breathe. All the evidence is right here in a Chad Flinderman novel. In my professional opinion, Toby Wyatt Flinderson should be under serious investigation. The fact that the police haven't arrested the guy yet, guys, guys, that speaks volumes. You know, well, you know, maybe we'll, we'll never know who actually did it. Uh, you know, maybe it was, Scub. Uh, you know, when, when I hear all this conspiracy theory stuff, uh, that's nonsense, obviously. Uh, I mean, they put this guy away for a reason, right? Look, honestly, I just want my life back. I know I made my mistakes. I did my time, but real people were strangled here and the culprit is still out there, just living his life when mine has literally been ripped from me. As soon as this investigation is over, I'm putting in the paperwork to get my name changed and I'm getting out of this town for good. I ain't got nothing to hide except a reputation that's been corrupted by the cops and that documentary that's been spreading my name across the whole world. I can't even get a job at a gas station. I have no education. And who wants to buy manufacturing equipment from the Scranton Strangler? Nobody's hiring me. Look, I, I feel bad for the people that he strangled. I really do feel bad for them. But this has strangled my entire life. I just, I want this to end. We've been told that there's a break in the ever-evolving story of the Scranton Strangler. We have a statement from the police that we will read on air. I'm now going to read the statement from the Scranton PD. In a coordination between multiple law enforcement agencies, contractors, and the victims, an arrest has been made in the Scranton Strangler case. Now, with cases of this high profile, not only due to the nature of the crimes, the length of time it has been, as well as both the media's obsession with the American workplace documentary's popularity, we have had to double, triple, and even several times quadruple check our work. There has been a break in the case. An arrest has been made. I have been authorized by the state district's attorney to share with you the name of the individual, as the evidence mounted against him is extremely damning. So, before I state the identity of that individual, and having stated everything properly thus far, I need to please request one final thing. And shove it up your butt. <laughs> 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 shove it up my butt. Damn it, Jim! You stole my afternoons, now you stole my line. It's not shove it up your butt, it's I'll kill you! I'll kill you dead! Shove it up your butt. <laughs> Shove, it <up. laughs> Shove it up your butt. Guys, that was it. <laughs> you pushed the chair away. Oh, which way? I don't know. Just lean back on it real quick. That's where you're at. Your butt. But this has strangled my entire life. Mic drop. Boom! Dramatic ending. Let's go, baby! I Woo! I can switch it up, change the energy a little bit yeah, if you like. Can you actually give me a Boston accent? <laughs> is, that, like, is it too late to... <laughs> do I need to get you an acting coach? But I guess he was waiting for me. Oh, I didn't realize you were going to be amazing at this. <laughs> uh, okay, so then... We'll try that again. That was good. 
I don't know if you laugh at serial flashers, <laughs> but I loved how you read it. That was great. You want me to do it again? Yeah, let's do it okay. again. Uh, look. This is when if you had glasses, you'd take them off. What if we gave you glasses just for this? <laughs> <laughs> Something weird happened. <laughs> Just think of everything glasses off my face now. <laughs> and I think Toby wanted to start asserting himself by choking people. 